So once in a while there's a lead that comes in and you say, man, we just need to look at this. And, you know, we've got a hint on what kind of cars are in there. We've never been in there. And so we're going to meet the owner, Robert, right now and uh, hopefully be surprised at this amazing collection sitting here in a warehouse in Iowa. Oh, look at this, going across the bridge. Well, this looks like an appropriate type of building to have old cars in. It's got that old glass block and curved glass windows. So this is the kind of place, if I were passing, I would stop my car and peek in the windows, which I do a lot. Mm. Here we go. So, we, as I said on the way here, we don't usually look for, uh, we don't usually follow up leads that we get from people. We like to drive around neighborhoods and looking for cars the old fashioned way. But this lead was just so intriguing that we decided to, in the middle of the winter time, 28 degrees is a high today, and, and look up this sports car collection in a, that's, that's been hidden in this building for decades, an old uh, dealership, which just looks fabulous on the outside, and I can't wait to see what's on the inside. So Robert is the owner of these cars, and he's gonna take us for a tour around the building before we go inside. This is called the Tease. I love his old glass block, man. Well, I had to, the wall was falling and I had to, this had, this had six rows instead of three. Oh, you had to fix that? Well, I, I, I blocked it up. It would have yeah, been the yeah. same uh, oh, I see. yellow brick as the rest of the yep. exterior. And, you know, uh, and I, I find it amazing. It was built in 41. I mean, we were at war. You know, no, I mean, we the, were getting ready for the getting war. Getting ready to go to war. Yeah, the so next... here's a guy with a brand new dealership and Within, I think, 42, the first four months of 42, cars ceased to exist, production of automobiles, because they were all making tanks and armament and right, that, right, jeeps right. and that sort of thing. Do you get people to ask you if you want to sell this place? Yeah, but they don't want to pay anything <clears> for it. Uh -huh. uh, a Crosley Hot Shot? With a hot rod engine. Oh, cool. Uh, now, what a great building, man. So this was an uninterrupted Buick dealership from 41 to 90. Roughly, yeah. 19, I don't know when uh, Austin Buick moved out, but it was right, they actually moved across the, uh, uh, the, the river here into ah. uh, Tama, Iowa. Yeah, every old dealership had that same wood paneling. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> this is my Mangusta. If you want to just peel this, there's two covers here. Look at how low this car is. What I've read is the GT40 got the number affixed to it because it's 40 inches high. Right. The Mangusta is 41. Holy mackerel. Now this was a car I'm told was function follows form. That to sit in this car was a very tough thing to do. Uh, Fred had come down here, sent a man down here to inspect it. And, and it's a, almost a numbers matching car. So this, this is a... Uh, a Di Tommaso Mangusta, which was a, the predecessor to the, the Pantera. The Pantera was the mass, <laughs> mass produced, was the mass produced car. And the, the Mangusta was, was the, 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 the car that was almost a prototype. They didn't build too many of them. 404. I mean, to look at it, unbelievable how beautiful they are. So the, these, this, oh, look at that. That's how you get to the engine. And, the, and, and, and if there were an engine, it would be right there. That's right. So the, this is the engine and transaxle are both out of here? Yes. What kind of transaxle is that? A ZF? ZF. Mm -hmm. Thank you. The 289 powered Mangusta was available uh, for sale in Europe, and the, you know, the ones that came to the States were 302 cubic inches. Wow, what a beauty. So have you restored this, or is this the way you got it? Um, actually, it's got quite a history. There, there, there was a Hollywood producer that sent it to Stewart's, which is a, a relatively well thought of restoration shop in California, and then turned it around. And I believe it was, it was either Road and Tracker Car and Driver did a, uh, an article in about 1993, I think, when it was restored. And uh, it, the, the name of the article was Alejandro's Spruce Goose. Alejandro de Tomaso is the builder. He was a, a, a wealthy uh, uh, Argentine horse breeder. And he toyed around with race cars, Formula One, 
and then decided to try to make automobiles. Uh, the, the Mangusta was a full, uh, full on production version car, marketing car that, that he built, 404 units. Then he, he, the association with Ford uh, led to the development of Pantera. These cars do not handle well. You, exactly. you can get oversteer and understeer faster than you can think of it. Uh, and and either, either scenario is kind of hard for a driver, but both scenarios right at, right at once is, is very difficult. Right. <laughs> uh, anyway, he got the, he got the, uh, he got the association and, and was able to market the cars on, in, in the uh, Lincoln Mercury uh, franchise of Ford. You, you don't have a tape measure, do you? It'd be funny to measure the height of this car just to make it a visual uh, 41 inches. Di Tommaso was a, a man and uh, a car company in, in Italy, and uh, he built race cars and street cars. He, was, he seemed to be uh, aligned with Ford. Uh, we've all heard of the Di Tommaso Pantera, which we've found a couple on the Barn 500 series. This is the, the, uh, the car that came out before the Pantera called a um, Mangusta. And to me, it's, it's, a, it's the more beautiful car. But I'm told this is a, a function follows form car, which means that you had to adapt to sit and drive this car because that's the design of it. And the design was more important than being able to drive it practically. It's a, it's a mid-engine, small block Ford, either 289 or 302 with a ZF gearbox. And uh, what we're trying to do now is, is measure the floor to the roof to see how high this is compared to the GT40, which uh, let's see, <clears throat> 40, 41 inches. So a GT40, which we know is a, a successful race car at Le Mans, it's called GT40 because it was 40 inches off the ground. That sounds like a good name, right? Well, this is a GT41, so to speak, because it's, <laughs> it's one inch taller off the ground than a GT40 is. So this was restored in the 90s? 93 is what sticks in my mind. So 25 years ago. Yeah. Hmm. It looks to be in real nice shape. Ooh. And and this is an early production car. It has the quad headlights that soon ran amuck with the uh, federal regulators. Ah. So there's only 50 of these built for the North American or USA market. What year is this car? This is a 68. No kidding. Wow. Well, it's a beauty. How many miles are on that? Uh, 30, 627. That's, is that since restoration, do you think? I do. 627 miles since restoration, which is 25 years ago. All right, so now we're going into the caverns here. Wow, look at this stuff. Oh, man. So you're not all sports cars. Oh, no, I'm eclectic. I'm a car nut. <laughs> I'm a car nut. Uh-huh. Yeah. So what, what, what about this Imperial? Uh, this is my latest acquisition. I really wanted the fin unit. This is a 65. So the seats are covered in plastic. I mean, so I guess this is... A oh, this is leather. Yeah, this beautiful. has been totally restored. Whoa. Is it 413 in here or something? Yeah. 413 yeah. cubic inch. Let's see if she'll start. Can we do that? Oh, we would love it. <clears throat> been sitting too long. Well, if I go out and get a jump pack in ether later, do you have time today? Sir, if you're, you're, you've brought this crew with you. I, I've got till the end of the week. Just, right, cool. uh, it's more a matter of what your time schedule is. Let's pull the hood release. Can you find the hood release? I'll, get, I'll put a jump pack on it. We can come back to it. Wow. What, I mean, but you could see this was over and above uh, what, what Chrysler uh, would have done with their street cars. Look at how pretty this is. And, and it's the same paint and the same finish as the rest of the body. Beautiful. And so it's got imperial valve covers, big old cast iron air, air conditioning system. Is this a dual air conditioner? Probably not in here. Uh, I don't think so. Yeah. You know, I wonder if, if you just now trying to start this if this liquid on the fender here is a result of that somehow. It's oil. It's oil. Oil out of the, what, that, that, is that the air? Air conditioning uh, condenser, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. I need to get that off. Oh boy, I, I, I can say, I want to be here for a while today. <laughs> this is pretty good. 
Check out this uh, parts counter here. Still let Art Deco look. No, this, this, I'm so glad we followed up on this lead because there can't be many places in the United States that are this authentic. All right, I have, I have a habit of when cars are covered, try to identify them through the cover just by feeling. So I, I have a feeling I know what that is because I can see the wheels on it, but I'm going to go through the motions anyway. <laughs> so it's a sports car, it's convertible. I'm playing along. I know exactly what this is because I can see it. It's a bug-eyed Sprite. So how many people in the world would have a 413 powered Imperial convertible parked 10 feet away from a bug-eyed Sprite? You, you are an eclectic individual. I love it. Wow. Tom, I'm not really a Hot rod guy, but that's that's uh, Pearl. Holy, that's that's her name, Minnie Pearl. <laughs> wow, wow, isn't that something? And I'm intrigued with this Dunlop uh, sticker on the wheels. The guy had actually uh, put knockoffs over the over the hubs to uh -huh. make it look like the uh, the. Uh, Twin cam and Jag uh, D and C types, or uh, uh, yeah, I, C and D types. I just saw an engine. I'm going to try to identify what it is. It's, a, it's like a, a Daim, 250 SP Daimler engine, but only half of it. Uh, Toyota? You're right. <laughs> Jeez. R16. R16, isn't that something? So that's out of like a, a, a mid-70s Toyota, late 70s Toyota? Not sure, but that sounds right. It's a Hemi, and uh, it's, it's the choice of SCCA hot rodders. That it, it's uh, Buku Quick. Wow. In fact, other than my hot shot, this is the quickest car that I own. I mean, it is scary quick. The, the Bug-Eye Sprite originally had hinged, hinges on the hood in the back and you lifted the front, but most racers converted the, the hinges from the back to the front to make it much easier to work on the engine, pull the engine, whatever. It's almost like they took the exhaust manifold from the Toyota and ran it backwards. Isn't that interesting? So it's got two, what, inch and a quarter SUs. I bet that thing's a blast. Is that a five speed? No, no, Four it's speed? it's got uh, the, the, uh, the original transmission in it. Oh. The only thing that's been uh, uh, bastardized or changed on it uh, is the is the battery shelf mm -hmm. that you could pull the motor out put the 948 in it and uh, 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 fix the battery shelf and you know change the hood if you wanted and go back to stock you know with that much effort <clears throat> I love it wow so and this, an MGTD uh, I know him well because I have one in my own garage huh. my uncle had a 52 I was 13 years old and it, it was five years ago that he finally al would allow me to own it. But by then he'd torn it completely apart. It was stacked in the, in the back of a trailer wow. and it was just too much of a project for wow. me. And I, uh, you know, I've, I'm learning, you don't take a car down without getting it back together. And I've got, I've got four cars that I've taken down and none of them ever got back together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the MGTD was the second generation of Sports car that U.S. soldiers coming back from World War II kind of brought back with them. Uh, the MGTC was the original one that it was. It was a version of this, but smaller and lighter, and had these really tall, skinny wire wheels. Seventeen inch. Seventeen inch, uh, and this was the more Americanized version, uh, and probably the more common one uh, in in the states for sure. But this this allowed Americans for a reasonable price to become part of a sports car, the sports car generation. People in the United States bought them and raced them. They would drive to tracks like Bridgehampton and Sebring and race them and hopefully drive them home again. They would take these headlights and turn them around so that the pointy one part was in the front so they would, had better aerodynamics. <laughs> uh, they'd take off the windshield. Uh, yeah, this, this is, this, you know, the, the sports car era that I wish I had been part of, this was the beginning of it. Well, show us what else you have here, Robert. So, Fassel Vega. French car. French car, Chrysler engine. All the trim is in stainless, uh, beautiful interior. 
this happens to be a Plymouth uh, uh, polydome. Uh, it's still uh, respectable, but not the the big uh, the big Hemi. The Rat Pack, the modern version of the Rat Pack, uh, Dean Martin and Frank Sinatra, Judy Garland, and that they all own Fassel Vegas. The, the, this is a '57 FVS two, I think. Can you read that up there? FV. Yes. Yeah. It's either two uh, or three. FV8. FV8. Or three. Three, I'm sorry. FV8. Uh, three. Made in Paris. Look at that. And it even gives the address. 19 Avenue George the Fifth, Paris. Made in France. Isn't that something? Hmm. And what taillights? Sheesh. There's a V in there. A V? A V in the taillight. Can you see it? Oh, look at that. Yes. Okay. Is this gas tank leather covered? And here's a factory tool kit. Wow. Is the tool tray out? It's, it's up here, yeah. So it's got spare bulbs, pliers, screwdriver, channel locks. It looks like a lug wrench, adjustable wrench, spare spark plug. And, and a box wrench that obviously, you know, is of the size to do some service on this car. That's a heck of a gas cap, too. It looks like a GT40. Le Mans. <laughs> yeah, race. It's yeah. a race gas cap. So see, this is like leather covered right here. I believe that's Hardura. That's a great car. So have, have you put miles on this car? I wanted to, and one day I kind of was rolling. I put it in reverse, and the transmission stopped. I put, took the transmission out and had it rebuilt. The, the, the parking brake, it, was, uh, you, it had no park on the transmission. There was no do dog that went down and locked the car. So you have, have to have, to safely operate the car, you have to use the uh, emergency brake as a parking brake. That cable, which is here somewhere, uh, it needs to be replaced. Mm -hmm. So I, I was kind of intimidated by driving a car around that I didn't feel safe to park with. Oh, yeah. And so there's a MGC Roadster, and over here is the, the hardtop version of it. That's a hardtop automatic. There was only about 20% of MGCs that came with that Borg Warner T35 uh, automatic. Borg, Borg Warner is, is an American T transmission? <laughs> Borg Warner is based in the United States, but they also had a base in, uh, in, in Europe. They, uh -huh. they supplied Volvo, um, American Motors, Triumph used uh, Borg Warner, Jaguar used Borg Warner. So here, you, with, with, uh, you can see the, how long that engine is. If we used to open it up a hood on MGB, you can see how long that motor is. And because this car has the trim on it, you can see the... Uh, you can see the the rays in the hood. So if you see, you know if you see at a car show or riding down the road a car, an MG with this lump and that lump, that means it's got a six-cylinder motor in it. I, I guess it's a somewhat misunderstood or uh, car. A lot, of, a lot of rumors about it, and I've never seen it with with disc wheels with hubcaps like this. I've only seen them with wire wheels. You're pretty sharp, Tom. <laughs> That's very rare. I only know of 10 in the United States. Really? Yeah. And how many came with automatics? Do you, do you have any idea? Yeah, uh, less than 20%. I think the number is 17%. Mm -hmm. A total production of uh, 8,000 uh, in the world. This was kind of, you know, if you think about an MGB, MGC, Austin Healey, Jag, this kind of was a, a, a lowercase Healy or Jaguar coupe almost. It's big six cylinder motor, but in a, in a lower priced MG body. That's a neat car, man. Wow. Okay, well, we're working our way around what I consider King Tut's tomb here. This is just pretty freaking amazing. By the way, I've been looking at this thing right here. Is that a console? That's my Mangusta. Ah, wow. So is that the back? Uh, no, that would be against the day. Okay. Huh. See the red? Yeah. That's the car number. That's the magic 52 number. 52 something. Wow. And that's fiberglass. Yeah. yeah. Pretty cool. Well, you know what? We've spent time with British cars. Let's go, let's hit an Italian car here. Let's, let's hit this Lamborghini. And I don't know anything about him, so uh, you're my guide. You're not serious. You know something about ah, Lamborghini. Ah, something about him. 
All right, so tell me, before we open the hood on this car, tell me, this is a, a Lamborghini, what? A Spada. A Spada. Um, Mr. Uh, Ferruccio Lamborghini was born under the sign of Taurus. And I believe that he had uh, an affection for anything related to bullfighting. So most <laughs> of his cars were named with the theme of, of, uh, of bullfighting. The espada is the sword used in the in the uh, the final act of slaying the bull. It's a four passenger, not a two passenger, and the only car that uh, could have had any car. But this is the car of choice for him. Jeez, what a monster! Wow, V12, four cam, six four, Weber, four, two barrels, four four liter. Weber is a dual choke carburetor. So when you have a Weber, you've got two carburetors. Mm -hmm. in, in essence here, you've got a choke for every cylinder. You don't get much more efficient. Yeah, no kidding. Wow. Not you, big. You, you wouldn't mind pulling the head off so we can measure the piston, would you? No, no, we can do that. Just give, it, <laughs> give me two minutes. <laughs> and I'm also looking here, here's the windshield washer bottle, and it's Lucas. So yeah, it's an Italian car with a British uh, electrical components. Well, that's a firm seat. Oh, that's a Cobra radio. That's one of those like breaker breaker one you buy nine. That at good target. buddy. Yeah, you yeah. buy that at Target. <laughs> What's the mileage? Twenty one thousand nine forty one. As far as I know, that's original. And wh where did you buy this car? What state was it? A Florida car uh, from an estate had been kept in storage, was in dry storage in a building. Uh, hmm. The attor an attorney um, sold it to liquidate in the state. One of the unique, the unique styling features of this car is the, the back window is kind of in two pieces. Let me take a look at that. And you really need that. In order to see out the back in the driver's position, you, you need to have that. that really does, that's the only way you can see what's behind you. Mm -hmm. So now we got this little white car over here we've been ignoring as we walk around. By the way, we've, we've been joined by uh, Kay. Kay. Okay, Kay, Tom Cotter. Nice to meet you. This is a series uh, I one. One. So you got toggle switches all the way across the dash. It's a 3.8 liter, I guess. 3.8. What year is it? This is a 1963. The uh, the E-Type is a um, the further development of the uh, race cars that were so successful at Le Mans, the uh, C and D-Type. Uh, one, uh, I, as I recall, three, three Le Mans uh, in three years. Mm -hmm. Me personally, this is the purest design. To, the, the coupe was what, was what was first off the drawing board, and the Roadster was the roadster cutting, is, cutting the roof off this car. The Roadster is sexy. The coupe is almost beyond description. And, you know, Enzo Ferrari said, the most beautiful car ever built. That was some compliment from a guy that built the pretty sexy cars himself. And uh, so here we have a 3.8 liter double overhead cam, straight six engine with three S2 carburetors. Such a sweet engine, such a sweet motor. They run so well, they have power, they have torque, they're smooth, they're quiet, beautiful. How long do you have this car? 83, 83, no 84. Kidding. Wow. Yeah. Again, this was my hunt for my dream car. Yeah. I wound up with a TD. On the way to the LAX, I picked up the Sunday paper, and there in the classifieds is this car. I called him up that night when I got home, and we made arrangements for me to come back in two weeks. You know, the price was right. The guy was up front. Uh, he was an engineer for... Uh, he had worked at Caterpillar in Peoria. He lived in Southern California. Uh, I flew out there again, saw the car. It became a, a matter of negotiation. He had an asking, I had an offer. I made my offer. He said yes so fast, I had made too high of an offer. Oh. <laughs> when I got the car, the manifolds were flash chrome. That's just uh, chrome over, uh, over steel. It's mm -hmm. not the right way to chrome plate something. But as soon as I saw the exhaust manifolds, I had to have it. Uh, originally, they were porcelainized, yeah, yeah, and yeah. and uh, they're quite attractive, done in sort of a very very dark gray. 
but as soon as water splashes up, they, they start to crack. And once they start to crack, they just continue to deteriorate. That's how the factory made them. Boy, that's a sweetheart. Now this car is a series one, which means it's got toggle switches on the dash like that. And then the series two had rocker switches. And then what did the series one and a half have? There was, there was a combination there? Uh, no, I think that that's when they enter. I believe that's when they introduced the rocker switches. Uh, okay. Uh, one and a half, that was only for one year, a transitional model. Uh, Tom, you know about what, 67? Yeah, 67, yeah. What a sweetheart. That, I think of your cars, this is my favorite. You are small. Graduation gift to myself. So this is a 71? 72. 72. Hmm. This was a, a, a GT uh, that I got in Memphis, uh, in the Memphis area. Mm -hmm. uh, again, uh, Randy Bailu uh, told me about it. Uh, I wanted to restore it. Uh, I take it all apart to do it right. And there you see the, the consequence of yeah, it. Yeah, projects are easy That's, to start and hard to finish. Right? Yeah, yeah. The, the, and then uh, this one is an early one because it doesn't have headrests. Yeah, that's the pull handle uh, white B. So that's probably 64, 63, 64? No, 63. 63. I believe that's the end of the pull. I think that's the end of the pull handle. Wow, I'm having a good day. I've never gone upstairs to look at cars before. This is this is a first. Who would know this is up here? This is like un you know, I fly over in planes and I look at down at buildings like this and wonder what cars are in there. Well, here's three. <laughs> so this is the body shop up here, huh? These were the body shops. Or a Jeepster. We've found a couple of Jeepsters uh, on the show before. I call this a grown-up TD. Is, it, is that a Hercules engine? It is. So it's a straight six. Huh. Interesting. This, this seems to be a nice shape. Boy, that, that, was, a nice, that, that was a nice restoration. Did you, did you restore it or did you buy it like that? I bought it like that. Wow. Nice top. Nice interior. 77,000 miles. So here's a Crosley. That's an elderly Crosley. That's an this old This is a 39. One. Wow. And the gas tank is as big as the motor. Again, this is a Wasion motor. So, you know, we'll, we'll probably never see this again on this series, but we saw a Hot Shot, which was one type of Crosley, which is post-war. This is a pre-war convertible. And now we have a post-war pickup truck. 46 pickup, first year of production. Has the chisel front end, and this would be the CC series. You could tell the steering wheels on all these. I mean, they look very much like a Jeep steering wheel. Very, very rudimentary. Well, you know a lot about this stuff. I gotta say that. But that's that's cute as a bug. Man, oh man. Wow, more station wagons. So we got another pickup and two more wagons. This is a cut down uh, wagon. Oh, it is. No kidding. So that one's got full wood siding on it. That's pretty cool. Robert, I have to tell you, okay, we've been doing this show now. We're starting our fourth year. If we were to discover this garage with three Crosleys, an MGA, an MGB, an MGB, and an Austin, and a, another midget back there or something, this would have been a fi the find of the day. Just this one garage. <laughs> and here it's just like a footnote. It tells me a lot about you. You got a 12 cylinder Lamborghini downstairs and you got these upstairs. It's unbelievable. What do we got over here? So, what store with this Jeepster? 
uh, I had the car repainted. Of course, I, I, I tried to do it right. Uh, that's the original color. Uh, mm -hmm. That's that maroon. 101,000 miles. Right. Is that a running car? Uh, it, it, it was, yeah. I, I, uh, I just came out of Florida. That, that would not be a bad car to just finish up what you started. Robert, in the, in the four years we've been doing Barn Find Hunter, I have to say this is one of the most significant, si significant finds that I've seen. I've never met anybody who's got an eclectic taste as wild as yours, and that's a compliment. I mean, I really mean it, that, that the same person who's interested in 12 cylinder Lamborghinis is also interested in Crosley station wagons, and you have an equal amount of passion in, in both areas, so. It is a passion. Yeah, well, thank, thank you for spending your morning with us. This has been an amazing day. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you for coming. You know, whenever we can on a Barn Find Hunter series, we try to start a car if, if it's not too much trouble. And this car, Robert says, should start without too much trouble. Great Chrysler Imperial with a great motor, a 413 engine, convertible, amazing car. And we just hooked the battery charger up to it for a couple of hours. So we're going to see if it starts. So. Voila. Oh, smooth. Man. Robert, that's amazing. 